researcher at UCL. <clears throat> and for the last few years, I've been running a study called the RADAR study, which is a randomized trial, <clears throat> sorry, um, evaluating, um, evaluating a gradual supported program of antipsychotic reduction and discontinuation. So I'll come to that. <clears throat> I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that. But what I wanted to talk to you today mainly about is my views about what psychiatric drugs are and what they do. Um, and th this is because, forgive me if, if you've all sort of taken this information on board already, but, but I think that generally there is a huge misunderstanding about what psychiatric drugs do. And that is a major stumbling block, I think, in us using them sensibly and in, um, in, in, in the ability of professionals to support people to come off them. So I'm going to share my screen now and um, show you my slides. I'm going to speak for about 40 to 45 minutes and then there'll be some discussion and time for questions. Um, screen share, right, there we are. Um, so I'm not sure it likes that. Can people see that? And people see, can you, can you nod at me, Neil? Yeah, okay, brilliant, thank you. Okay, great, so um, I, I hate it when people mention books, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So I've just uh, republished the second edition of A Straight Talking Guide to Psychiatric Drugs, um, which has got all the latest um, data in it as far as I'm concerned on what we need to know about psychiatric drugs published by PCCS books that you may have heard of that are really good publishers, publishes a lot of challenging titles in the mental health world. So one of the things that you will probably be aware of is that there are highly contrasting views about the nature and effects of psychiatric drugs. So there are those who regard them as miracle cures, um, as chemicals that have truly enabled psychiatry to become a properly medical specialty and to transform itself from um, a previous, previous custodial system. And there are those who, I'm, as I'm sure you know, who find that uh, psychiatric drugs and antipsychotics in particular are the most horrible th thing they've ever experienced, that taking them is like being in a drug prison or a living hell, as these comments suggest. And um, one of the reasons I think there are such contrasting views is that there is this fundamental misconception about what psychiatric drugs are doing. And this misconception is, the, uh, it is, is widespread. It is the accepted view of what psychiatric drugs do. It's the view that you'll come across if you look at a psychiatric textbook or a psychopharmacology textbook or a pharmacology textbook. And, that the, and it is this idea that drugs, the drugs work by correcting an underlying biological abnormality. So in other words, that they have what um, John Davis, a, a very well-known psychiatric researcher called a normalizing effect. Now, generally that normalizing effect is theorized because we don't know any of this, but it's theorized to be a, um, working on a chemical imbalance, rectifying an underlying chemical imbalance. Sometimes people talk about um, drugs correcting abnormalities of neural circuitry or networks um, and sometimes they don't specify how that what the drugs are actually correcting but there's still um, in most cases this underlying assumption that that's what they're doing uh, and this view of course has been widely popular pop, uh, publicized by the pharmaceutical industry uh, in numerous advertisements I like this one best because it shows uh, the woman in the very in the balanced position here uh, and this uh, and all these adverts emphasize how imbalances of certain chemicals are thought to lead to the symptoms of mental illness and the drugs work by balancing these chemicals so this idea that drugs are working on an underlying abnormality is what i have called the disease centered model of drug action <clears throat> so it's the idea that the therapeutic effects of drugs arise from their effects on the biological mechanisms that produce symptoms of a particular condition. Um, it, this model doesn't necessarily say the drugs correct the underlying fundamental problem, um, but it, it does draw an analogy with the way that most drugs work in general medicine. So for example, 
asthma treatments, the you know the common Ventolin inhaler, um, doesn't it doesn't correct the underlying problem in asthma. It works by reversing the biological basis, the biological mechanisms that cause airways constriction, and therefore it reduces wheezing and helps breathing. <clears throat> and painkillers like aspirin and paracetamol also obviously don't correct the cause of the disorder, but they work on the biological mechanisms that produce the symptom of pain. So that's the disease-centered model. But what I've been saying over the years is there is another way of understanding what drugs do, which I've called the drug-centered model, to emphasize that the medications we take are drugs, and that and drugs are chemicals that interact with the normal workings of the body and they create an abnormal or an altered state and the drugs that we use in psychiatry all cross the blood brain barrier so they they change the normal state of the brain in particular and what this model suggests is that sometimes these changes produce useful effects when they interact with symptoms of mental disorders or um, you know underlying problems of emotions or um, feelings or thinking. So an example of the drug-centered model might be the effects of alcohol on social anxiety, for example. So one of the changes, one of the behavioral changes that alcohol causes is it reduces, it reduces inhibitions, social inhibitions. Um, and when this is superimposed onto underlying social anxiety, it can therefore um, be helpful. Um, but it's not correcting any underlying chemical imbalance. Another example, which is actually from medicine, is the effect of opiate anaesthetics. So opiates, opiates like morphine, for example, probably have some disease-centered action. They, they work directly on pain conduction uh, processes to show, slow up pain messages getting to the brain. But they also have what we call psychoactive effects. They are, they are also substances that enter and change the brain. And one of the characteristic effects they have, um, emotional effects they have, is, uh, is they produce feelings of emotional indifference. So people who've taken opiates for pain will often say that they still have some pain, but they don't care about it anymore. And that aspect of their effect is what I would call a drug-centered effect. So the drug-centered model highlights the fact, as I said, that psychiatric drugs are what we might call psychoactive drugs. They're drugs that change the brain because they, they work on the brain. And by doing so, they change our mental state. So they produce changes in normal sensations, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. They all also affect other parts of the body. <clears throat> so there are associated physical changes. Um, and, and often these are linked with the mental changes. So if you think of the sedation that is produced by a drug like, um, like Valium, for example, or a barbiturate that might be used in anesthetics, um, that sedation has both mental and physical components. So th this is, it seems like such a basic point, but I think it's something we've lost sight of because we've got so um, sucked into this idea that drugs work by rectifying an underlying abnormality. We have forgotten that drugs change the normal state of the body and the brain, and that these changes are manifested in changes in mental activity, behavior, and physical functioning. There are, the, Changes that drugs produce at different times also change, and that's important to think about as well. So if you take one or two doses of a drug, um, you, will get, you, you will notice some immediate effects, usually with, with most psychiatric drugs. Some, some psychiatric drugs in particular have very subtle effects, so you might not immediately notice the changes, but with most things, for example, something like a drug like haloperidol, you would notice some changes straight away usually. Now, you might stop taking it after one or two doses, and if you're very unfortunate with some drugs, you might be left with some, some changes, some alterations. Um, it's, that's unusual after one or two doses, but can happen with some drugs. Um, 
well, if you take a drug for uh, repeatedly for a long period of time, you might still experience some of those short term effects, but the body will react to the presence of the drug. It will change and the brain changes and that might in itself produce some changes um, in, in your feelings and emotions and behaviours. Then, of course, if you stop the drug, you're, you're um, unbalancing the body again because the body's trying to balance out its effects. So you will get withdrawal related changes, withdrawal effects. And sometimes after long term use, even when you've stopped the drug completely, there will be persistent changes, persistent changes in the brain that are manifested in mental and physical changes or symptoms. So just to think about these different effects, uh, just to give you a couple of examples, um, let's think about benzodiazepines, for example, and let's think about what we know about what produces these different sorts of changes. So we know with benzodiazepines that the immediate effects they produce, so these are the subjective experience of taking a benzodiazepine is a feeling of relaxation, both mental and physical. And we know that what benzodiazepines do um, predominantly is increase the activity of GABA, this, this chemical in the brain, which is a, an inhibiting chemical. So it slows down neural active, neurological activity in general. Um, and that's probably the mechanism behind those immediate effects. <clears throat> if you keep taking it long term, we, we know that you become less responsive and, and the degree of sedation and relaxation you get reduces. And that's what we call tolerance. And that's because the body has adapted in some way to the presence of the drug. Now, there are some suggestions that sometimes if, when people are taking these drugs long term, they might end up with increased anxiety. And that may be because the adaptation of the GABA system has gone too far. So it's, um, the body's made it, it sort of reduced its um, reactivity in response to the benzodiazepines. And it may have reduced it so far that actually you get excess anxiety, even though you're still taking these GABA enhancing drugs. And then there are some um, long term complications such as cognitive deficits, but we don't we don't know what the mechanism behind them is. When you stop taking benzodiazepines, of course, you get this withdrawal syndrome. We're, we're familiar with that. And that's probably largely caused by decreased GABA activity that is unopposed by the drug because you've taken the drug away and um, manifested in increased anxiety and insomnia, etc. And then we know that um, some people, unfortunately, even when they've stopped benzodiazepines and even after quite long um, a long time of being drug free have persistent effects which can include anxiety but also sort of hyper -sense sensory experiences like tinnitus and um, hyperesthesia that's tingling and, and pain in the, um, usually in the um, feet and fingers um, and we don't know what the mechanism of, of that is And uh, with antipsychotics as well, you can think again about these different sorts of effects and what their mechanisms are. The immediate effects of an antipsychotic like haloperidol are largely produced by blockade of dopamine two, type 2 receptors. It, it does affect lots of other systems, but it does have particularly strong effects on, on uh, these particular receptors. Um, Long-term effects you're still probably getting the effect of some dopamine blockade, but in some cases you might get um, an adaptive increase in dopamine activity. So the body tries to counteract the dopamine activity, the dopamine blockade, and sometimes it overshoots. And that's thought that's one theory of um, of the mechanism behind tardive dyskinesia, these abnormal movements that you get when you use antipsychotics like haloperidol for long periods. Um, it, it's, it's known to reduce brain volume <clears throat> uh, slightly. We don't know the mechanism behind that. Um, there is a withdrawal reaction, which may include psychosis in some circumstances. This is probably due to a rebound increase in dopamine um, and, and possibly also in other neurotransmitter activity.
Um, and it may be that there are persistent effects as well. <clears throat> we don't really know the basis of those, but um, we know that tardive dyskinesia can persist even when people have uh, stopped taking antipsychotics, at least for long periods of time. You'll notice there are quite a few question marks there, and that's because there are lots of aspects of drug mechanisms of how drugs produce the, um, the mental and physical changes that they produce that we do not understand. Uh, and in fact, we probably understand these two better than most. Now, just a little bit of history here. Prior to the 1950s, drugs were generally understood as acting according to this drug-centered model. And I think you can see this, you, you, you can see this in, in psychiatric textbooks and, and literature, but I think it's even reflected in advertisements like this. So this is an advertisement for amphetamines, which was widely prescribed for depression. And this advertisement, it seems to me, is clearly advertising the fact that these are stimulant drugs that will make you more energetic and more confident. And this is an advertisement for barbiturates, which of course are sedative drugs, and this is clearly emphasizing its sedating properties. The first modern psychiatric drugs were the um, early, what we now call antipsychotics, such as chlorpromazine, which were introduced in the 1950s. And it, I think it's really interesting and important to appreciate that these were also initially understood according to a drug-centered model. So initially, they were thought to be special sorts of sedatives. And indeed, they were referred to early on as neurological inhibitors and uh, also as neuroleptics, which has a similar meaning, lepsis meaning restriction or seizure, and, and also, of course, as major tranquilizers. And this again is reflected in this advertisement for the antipsychotic drug Melaril. But over the course of the 1960s and, and 1970s, these ideas changed and they started to come to be seen as working in a disease-centered manner, as working um, by targeting an underlying biological abnormality. And this is a quote from a textbook of the time, they appear to do more than tranquilize. And this is an advertisement from the 1970s with a very psychedelic target because it's, it's 1970. But the point is it's a target. And this advertisement is emphasizing the idea that this drug targets an underlying abnormality. Something similar happens with antidepressants. So the, um, the first drugs that were proposed to have antidepressant properties were drugs that were used for the treatment of TB. And they were very similar to stimulants and they had a stimulant-like adverse effect profile. If you took them for too long, you couldn't get to sleep and you became psychotic, just as you would do if you take a lot of amphetamines for a long time, or many people will. <clears throat> uh, and, and that was early descriptions of these drugs make that quite clear, but gradually people start to um, relegate that sort of information into the small print of papers and just call it their side effects. And there's more and more emphasis on distinguishing antidepressants from stimulants and saying that they work uh, specifically against depressive symptoms, as in this advertisement here. So <clears throat> what happens over the course of the 1950s and 60s is this change from a drug-centered understanding of, of drugs to a disease-centered understanding. And I think you can see that actually most clearly in how the drugs are named and classified. So prior to the 1950s, drugs are named and classified according to the sorts of effects that they produce, uh, the sorts of alterations they produce. So you have cr crudely, because no one's terribly interested in drugs at this time, drugs classified as sedatives or stimulants. From the 1950s onwards, drugs start to be named and classified according to the disease they are thought to treat. So we start to hear and see talk of antipsychotics and antidepressants, etc. And this transformation does not occur because there is a whole load of evidence that the drugs really work in a disease-centered way. Um, 
there, there wasn't then and there isn't now any really convincing evidence that any class of, of psychiatric drugs works in that way. <clears throat> That's mainly because the vast majority of evidence that we have consists of placebo controlled trials. <coughs> Sorry. And these trials do not distinguish between whether a drug is working in a drug centered or a disease centered way because you're comparing an active drug that is causing mental and physical alterations with an inert placebo. Um, and ideas that mental disorders are caused by deficiencies or abnormalities of brain chemicals such as the dopamine theory of schizophrenia or the monoamine or serotonin hypothesis of depression have not been substantiated. They were post hoc ways of justifying drug use according to a disease centered model. So someone in the 60s showed that one of haloperidol's main actions was to block dopamine receptors and they then said, aha, but because we think haloperidol works by targeting the underlying basis of schizophrenia, therefore schizophrenia must be the opposite, it must, it must be an abnormality in the dopamine system that's opposite to the effects that are caused by haloperidol. And independent evidence um, of any dopamine abnormalities is, is lacking. There are some references if you want to go and have a look at, um, a look at that. But I, I want to now just think about the drug-centered uh, drug centered model of drug action generally, just because I think, it, I think it presents an alternative way of thinking about drugs, which, and usually I, I start my talk by saying this actually, um, which I think shows that some drugs can be useful in some situations. I am not completely anti-medication at all, uh, but I think first of all, we need to understand much better what particular changes different drugs produce in order to understand when they might be useful. I also think we need to be a lot more wary than we are about starting and continuing people on long-term medication. <clears throat> so first of all, thinking about antipsychotic drugs, what sort of mental and behavioral alterations do they produce? <clears throat> well, we've got reasonable evidence on this, particularly for the older antipsychotics, because when they first came in in the 1950s, as I said, they were still understood according to that drug centered model. So the psychiatrists and researchers who uh, introduced them were interested in the sort of alterations they produced. Um, they even, two of the uh, French psychiatrists who first used chlorpromazine even got one of their junior doctors to take um, quite a large dose of chlorpromazine and, and write down a diary of, of how it affected him. Uh, and, and there were animal experiments as well. And these largely show that these drugs, as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, you know, shut down arousal and activity or reduce arousal and activity. So they reduce movement and attention and reaction times. Um, and subjectively, they make people feel sedated, a bit flattened um, and reduce people's initiative and motivation. <clears throat> uh, and people who are patients who are prescribed them describes uh, similar similar sorts of effects, feelings of mental and physical stagnance, feeling emotionally empty um, and, and feelings of lethargy and indifference. I should say, I, um, I, not all antipsychotics are the same. Antipsychotics are, uh, describes a collection of quite, of, of diverse chemical agents uh, and some have stronger effects than others, and they all have a different biochemical profile. They all act in slightly different ways. Um, some of them have strong effects on D2, dopamine 2 receptors, which mean that they cause this sort of Parkinson's-like state, which is probably connected to the um, mental slowing and emotional indifference that they cause. But others, such as clozapine and olanzapine, um, quetiapine, um, seem to work in a slightly different way, do not cause this Parkinson syndrome to the same extent, don't block dopamine as, uh, receptors nearly as, as strongly, um, but nevertheless <clears throat> still seem to induce these feelings of emotional indifference, although maybe with a slightly of, of a slightly different quality. Uh, so, so as I mentioned, um, this is Pierre Denica, one of the French psychiatrists who uh, 
who was first using these drugs and, and interested in the alterations they produced. And he actually proposed that antipsychotics worked because they produced a form of Parkinson's disease. Uh, and, 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 that, uh, and, and that was associated with a dampening down of, um, of thinking processes and a reduction of emotional response reactivity. Um, so he proposed that people simply lose interest in their delusions and become less preoccupied and less um, involved in their psychotic world, psychotic symptoms. I think this quote sums up the effects of antipsychotics really well. This is someone who was taking haloperidol for an acute psychotic episode. Uh, and she says, although I felt very well, I felt as if I had absolutely nothing to talk about. I kept wondering about whatever it was that had been so interesting during most of my life that I had suddenly lost. But I was very much in contact with the reality and for that I was thankful. Um, I don't know if any of you know the cartoons of Auntie Psychiatry. I think they're really clever and this is one of my favourites. And I think she's expressing this same idea, this, um, this, this awful dilemma that people have that the drugs um, can help to suppress this sometimes attractive but also dangerous and often distressing world of psychosis and yet what they replace it with is a rather grey version of normality um, feeling rottenly normal is how um uh, is is how oliver sachs the neurologist's brother who was treated with these drugs described it so if you understand antipsychotics in that way, and that's just a very sort of brief, crude um, overview, I think you can understand that they may well have effects that are able to Don't worry, folks. Joanna did tell us that sometimes her internet and stuff goes off, but it only goes off for a few seconds, so she will be back. Just while we're waiting for Joanna, if anybody has got any questions that they want to ask, feel free to put them on the Q&A and there will be a space at the end to, to address them. Now it does show that there's a slight increase in rates of relapse uh, in people who are, with, who are undergoing a, this gradual reduction process compared to people who stay on maintenance treatment um, early on. But as time goes by, relapse rates um, come together and what this study also showed which was really interesting is that if you follow people up for long enough it seems that people who have an opportunity to do a gradual reduction even if they don't manage to um, you know don't succeed in getting off have better outcomes at the end of the day than people who are randomized to maintenance treatment now this effect has been shown in some other longitudinal studies but they haven't been randomized and so this study is important because these groups, the groups who were doing the reduction and the groups on the maintenance were randomly selected. Uh, so they, they're not systematically different from each other. You can't say, oh, the, the discontinuation group did better because they were just a milder set of people with a milder set of problems. Um, there's been more and more evidence over the last few years that antipsychotics do cause brain shrinkage. This has been shown in, in human studies, but also in animal studies. Those are the most convincing ones. Um, so given that and given the uncertainty about their benefits, I think that you know, we can say that we're still unsure about the risks and benefits of starting long term antipsychotic treatment. Um, and we're still unsure about the long term outcome of a gradual process of antipsychotic reduction. And it looks like some people can do well um, without long-term treatment. Um, and, and therefore, for some people, being on long-term treatment is going to do more harm than good. And this is what the RADAR study is exploring. So we're trying to replicate the study with, that was done in the Netherlands with people who had a first episode, with people who've had more than one episode of psychosis. 
and we've just finished recruiting and we'll be reporting in about two years time. So I'm just going to say a couple of words about antidepressants and then I'll, I'll stop talking and we can have some discussion. So I just wanted to think about how the drug centred model might apply to the use of antidepressants. So the first thing we need to know is what sort of mental and behavioural alterations different sorts of antidepressants produce. And the first thing to say about this is that we don't have very much information about this because uh, unlike the antipsychotics, no one has shown a great interest in it. There are very few volunteer studies that have really um, looked at this in any detail, for example. What we do know from the few volunteer studies that exist and from patient reports is that the tricyclics, and, and this is not surprising because they're similar to the neuroleptics, are very sedating, cause some cognitive impairment and um, are experienced as being unpleasant by people who take them, especially at higher doses. SSRIs and um, other more modern antipsychotics, some of these have, sorry, antidepressants, some of these have much more subtle psychoactive effects, so people may not really notice that they feel very different, but they do seem to produce some feelings of emotional numbness or disengagement. Um, and this seems to also be related to their known effects on sexual functioning. So they cause reduced libido and other forms of sexual dysfunction, reduced sensitivity. Uh, and this again might be linked with feelings of lethargy, which again, they seem to, seem to cause in, when they've been used for longer periods particularly. Now, some of these drugs also seem to cause agitation, particularly in younger people. We're not sure why there are different effects in younger and older people, but it does seem to be particularly in younger people. And this may be associated with suicidal impulses um, occasionally. Uh, and <clears throat> unlike say benzodiazepines, which, which uh, some people um, enjoy, some people find pleasurable, and antipsychotics um, that most people find unpleasant to take, SSRIs are, are usually fairly neutral, but at higher doses, volunteers find them rather unpleasant. So what does that mean about whether how useful they might be in, in uh, depression? Well, there are two ways in which they might be affecting people with depression. One is the, this interaction between their psychoactive effects and the symptoms of depression. And for example, drugs that um, cause emotional numbness might reduce the intensity of depressive feelings but they also almost certainly have um, we, we know have placebo effects and amplified placebo effects so they're not just it, taking an antidepressant is not just the same as taking an inert tablet you are taking something that you notice makes you feel different and that's what I mean by amplified placebo effects um, so the question is, are any of these effects actually useful in people who have depression? And placebo controlled trials using these inert placebos show that um, if you take a huge number of trials involving thousands, probably millions of people in total, um, the overall there is a very small difference in favour of antidepressants, which amounts to about two points on the Hamilton rating scale, which is a rating scale that has a maximum score of 54 points. Um, and that's lots of different meta-analyses have found exactly that same effect, this very small difference between antidepressants and placebo. And this um, almost certainly isn't, an effect, isn't a difference that actually makes any noticeable difference to anyone. So if you compare Hamilton's scores with um, <clears throat> clinical global improvement ratings, you'll find that a, a change of three points on the Hamilton scale doesn't register as a change at all on the clinical global improvement scale and you need to have shown a difference of at least eight points on the Hamilton scale to show even minimal improvement. Uh, and in real life, real life trials also seem to confirm that antidepressants have negligible effects um, or pretty poor effects. So this is the huge STAR D study that was conducted in the United States. It wasn't a placebo controlled trial, it was a trial that um, of stepped care. So people got free what was meant to be really good standard um, psychiatric care. Uh, and they were started on one antidepressant and then there was an algorithm that, um, you know, that, that guided further antidepressant treatment if they didn't respond to the first one. And what that found 
is that the number of people who got better and stayed better for a year um, was that tiny number in the middle. It's, it's about 100 people out of 4,000. So it was very small. And all the rest either relapsed or um, dropped out or never got better in the first place. So, so I, I think that overall the evidence suggests that antidepressant induced alterations are not useful for people who have depression. Um, and I think that what we should be telling people who are thinking of starting on antidepressants is uh, we should be emphasizing that these are drugs that change the normal, the normal state of the brain, that we don't understand really how they do that. Um, and that because through those brain changes, they do change people's thinkings and sensations and emotions. But again, we don't really quite understand how. They can produce a severe withdrawal reaction, particularly when people have been taking them for long periods of time. Um, and most worryingly, we don't know if some of these changes actually normalize in the long term when people have stopped taking them. And that's because there's some evidence, or well, first of all, some people have experienced persistent um, withdrawal symptoms uh, even when they've stopped the drug for a long time and also because people some people are reporting that the sexual dysfunction uh, certain aspects of that anyway persist after they've stopped taking the drug and this is just really to emphasize how little we know about all the mechanisms involved in antidepressant action um, so we think that their immediate changes may be due to, due to increased serotonin activity, but we're not really sure. Um, they do have other effects. We don't know what it is that causes the long-term changes they produce, or the withdrawal effects, or the persistent effects that have been noted. So I'll, I'll just summarize very quickly. What I want to get across to you is that I believe that uh, mainstream psychiatry and psychopharmacology fundamentally misunderstand the nature of psychiatric drugs and what they are doing and underestimate um, the ways that these drugs change the normal way that the brain and body function and the ways that these changes can lead to um, some harmful symptoms and, and some that may even persist. Um, and I think we need to appreciate all this about psychiatric drugs in, able, in order to be able to use them much more wisely and much more cautiously. Okay, so thank you very much. I shall stop my screen share and I'd be really interested to hear people's views and, and answer some questions. How far is this sort of drug-centered approach from the mainstream of psychiatry is it sort of starting to emerge um, as, as something that's viable or is it still a distance away? Well, I would, um, it's diff difficult for me to say because obviously I mix with other psychiatrists who share similar views. So I would say that it's, you know, there's certainly a substantial number of psychiatrists who do subscribe to it. Um, th there are quite a lot of prominent psychologists who subscribe to it. Uh, and um, but 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 the, the sort of leading psychiatric researchers generally don't, I would say, and not that not many of them have challenged me. They just ignore it <laughs> and carry on as usual. OK, thank you very much, Joanna. Um, what's happening now for the, for the rest of the people watching this event? Um, we are now inviting a panel of people who've been to previous events, part of the organising group, to reflect on what they've heard and, and, and relate that to their own experiences and to also offer their comments. And we'll do that for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to the Q&As that we've received. I can see there's 18 already very deep questions I can see there. And also uh, Rita and Jake may incorporate something about what's been said in the chat into, into their, into their uh, feedback. So um, could I invite then maybe the panel to organize amongst ourselves, just show your hand if you want to come next. And if anybody would like to start off with their, with their observations and perspective. Uh, Rita. Yeah, just really quickly, I think 
Joanna, your presentation was great, but it, it, it's what it summed up for me, for a person who's been through the system, um, how confusing it is, and that when you're actually faced with a dilemma of feeling totally overwhelmed, in distress, psychosis, mania, whatever words you want to use for it, um, how our choices are so limited, and that sometimes, I know for me, and I'm not speaking for everybody, but for me, it's a case of you do anything. <laughs> So you just do what's there. And I think for me, it, it, it's sort of shown really that there, there isn't, or it doesn't seem to be unless you can educate us so otherwise, much of an alternative when people are in those states. I'm just saying if anybody would like to say something else and Joanna can maybe pull a few things together based on our comments. So, Jake. Hi, so my question is around what, what is happening at the, at the kind of forefront of not just um, psychiatric treatment at the minute, but mental health treatment, you know, where's it going? What, what are we going to see happen next? Are we going to see these kind of um, gray areas in the research developed or are we seeing a move a movement away from uh psychiatric drugs and and you know what's what's happening you know what what, what seems to be where where's the energy going at the minute in, in into in terms of that thank you jake and anybody else like to come in uh and andy um so two points really um i was very interested in the the points that you were raising about um, well within the drug centered uh, model the way in which we can um, understand that some of the uh, sort of uh, sedation and disinterest is actually part of the effect of the antipsychotic and not necessarily the psychosis and um, it's sometimes quite hard um, as a family member trying to support someone uh, to to wade through this and to to get psychiatrists to understand that actually the impact of the medication is um, actually damaging in terms of um, someone's interest in just taking part in the world. The other point I wondered whether you could answer is that um, um, there's in terms of this question about finding the an appropriate dose for someone who has been in, in, in distress and for whom uh, psychiatric medication may not take away all their symptoms. Um, there's uh, a sort of um, attitude by many that if you reduce a dose um, and then someone is perhaps too, you do that carefully, someone is too agitated and it doesn't you know, and you need to raise it again, that somehow if you raised it to, to what it was, that they wouldn't necessarily come back to where they are. So that it's a risk to reduce it because otherwise you're actually going to have more medication. And I wondered whether there was any real evidence for that. And yeah, if you could say something. I think that's probably enough, Joanna, to get on with. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and we'll come back to ask one more round of questions or observations from the panel after Joanna's had an opportunity to respond, please. So I'll, I'll go I'll go in reverse order if that's all right. So Nandi, um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so I mean, I think I think the first part was you were making a comment, you, you know, a comment really on on this on how it is the drugs who you know the drugs can cause this lack of interest, uh, and and it's important to recognise that and not assume that that's part of the condition. I think that's really important. Um, now, you're absolutely right, and I'm glad you've highlighted this, that there is this sort of myth around that if you stop the drugs and someone has a relapse or you just, you know, or you reduce them and someone's symptoms come back, that it will be worse and they'll never get back to their usual state. So there are several follow-up studies looking at this. Most of them show that people return to their baseline level quite quickly. One of them shows that it does take a bit longer, up to about a year, but people do still return to their baseline level of symptoms 
once their previous dose is reinstated. So I really don't think there's any evidence. And I think that's, I think that's a hangover of this really dangerous idea that, that started in the 1990s, that psychosis is a, a toxic brain process. I don't know if any of you have come across this, but th this idea was going around. It was, you know, whipped up by pharma and, and sort of pharma allies. Um, and, the main, and the main bit of evidence behind it were these brain scans that showed the shrinking of the brain over time. And then, it, and then it transpired that all these brain scans were in people who were on medication to start with. So this was, you know, no one, no one had ever demonstrated this was anything separate from the medication. Um, but at that time, everyone assumed that what was happening in the brain was due to the schizophrenia, not the antipsychotics. Um, so I, I think it's a hangover of that idea, that idea that psychosis is a toxic brain syndrome and that if you don't treat it, it's dangerous and it'll, you know, have dangerous effects. Having said that, um, I do think you have got to be careful with reducing medication and, and, you know, you can, we know from the literature on benzodiazepines in particular, you know, if you stop them suddenly, you can be left with really nasty symptoms that go on for a long time, you know, sort of physical symptoms of tinnitus and anxiety and things. So, um, so I do think, you, you know, we've all got to be careful in, in reducing medication. Um, but I don't, you know, if, if there are any persistent symptoms when someone's reduced medication, I don't think that's because of the underlying psychosis, what's happening with that. It may be a consequence of, you know, too rapid withdrawal. Uh, so, yeah, so that was to respond to you. Um, Jake, what, what are future trends? Yeah, good question. Um, so, so, so I think there are good and bad things happening. I mean, you know, over the last sort of 20 years, we've had the setting up of these early intervention in psychosis teams. And certainly many of them seem to me to be, they've got, a, you know, they're staffed by a lot of psychologists and a lot of them seem to me to be really trying to um, help people avoid being medicated or avoid being medicated for too long. They, they certainly seem to help people to try and come off after one episode at least. Um, and, and, you know, and they're well staffed and, and there's psychology and therapeutic input. So, so, so I think there is that movement. And um, as it, by doing the radar study, I've come across that there are lots of groups doing antipsychotic discontinuation studies in people who've just had one episode. So that's, you know, there's quite a lot of interest. And, and the group in Australia have done a, a very interesting study where they've compared people with an acute psychotic episode. Uh, they've done a placebo controlled trial and it's never really been done before properly, believe it or not, um, where they're comparing antipsychotic treatment with placebo plus really good sort of psychosocial support. Um, so, you know, I think there are those things going on there is increasing concern about, you know, antidepressant withdrawal effects. Um, but then there are also lots of people still, you know, emphasizing how, how beneficial antidepressants are. And we know that prescriptions are still going up. So, you know, that, that does worry me that we haven't really, you know, we still haven't really got across this message that actually we must stop getting people stuck on long-term medication we've got to we've got to have ways of avoiding that so good and yeah i think there are good and bad things um yeah but but having said that not you know not and nice are also doing a review of um of uh withdrawal from prescribed medication so that there is some concern about about people getting onto long-term medication and, and the difficulties of getting off as well in in you know in government circles um, and Rita, uh, yeah, um, another really good question about alternatives, uh, and 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 that does get to the heart of it, really, doesn't it? What you know, it, when you are feeling really desperate, what what do you do? When it, I, I saw there was a there was a question on the chat as well about someone who said, you know, they'd been um, having therapy for for anxiety for two, you know, four years, but it's still really not working. You know, what can they do? Um, I mean, I, I suppose there, there isn't a magic answer, is there? I'm sure we're all aware of that. And, and it's, about, it's about trying to 
work out where that anxiety comes from and how you can change your life to try and deal with it or the depression. Um, and what I would say, I think, is, you know, as far as anxiety is concerned, I think we do have drugs that will make you feel less anxious. I mean, benzodiazepines are really quite good at that. Um, uh, and SSRIs might have a sort of weaker take the edge off sort of effect for anxiety. Um, I think the message is just don't get stuck on these things long term. If you have to, if you feel that, you know, there's no other alternative, take something short term, but, 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 but stop it. Have a plan for how long you're going to take it and when and how you're going to stop it. Yeah. Joanna, I, I've got a question for you as well. I'm, I'm aware that there's quite a lot of people I'm working with in, within our recovery learning community that are required to take, take their medication because they're under some kind of mental health act, like a community treatment order. And if they don't comply with their treatment, they are told they will be returned to hospital. You know, to, 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 but they don't want the medication, don't feel it helps them. And it seems to be that, I just wonder how psychiatrists feel about this kind of sense of coercion and, and requirement when it seems to me that you get the diagnosis of schizophrenia, that means you get a certain status legally, and then you're required to take the medication, which may, may or may not be working for you at all, and may be causing you harm. Mm -hmm. I wonder, is there, is there any live debates or any kind of energy around this concern about how much we're using coercion to yeah. treat people who are in high levels of crisis? So you may know, um, I mean, my... Uh, my, my biggest beef in this area is the community treatment order. I think, I think when people are really psychotic and acutely disturbed, I, I, I think there are some circumstances when we do need to take over and be paternalistic and take people into hospital. Um, but, uh, but I don't like community treatment orders because we are forcing uh, drugs into people's bodies when they are able to be out of hospital, when they're, you know, when they're recovered uh, and they're able to function. And they, most, most people in that situation can make, you know, competent decisions about whether they want to take medication or not. And in my view, they should be able to, to take those, those decisions. And I think it just really highlights, I, I mean, forced treatment in general highlights how we are using these medications to change people's behavior. And in some, some situations to change people's personality. Um, and look, we do do lots of things to change our personality. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but um, you know, when you go to therapy, you're trying to change yourself, aren't you, in some way. Um, but forced treatment is forcibly changing someone's behavior and personality. And I think that's a really, really serious thing to do and needs to have oodles of safeguards around it. Uh, needs to be a much more democratic process than it is at the moment um, and should not be allowed when people are competent and functioning in the community. Thank you, Joanna. Um, I just wonder if there's any other questions or points of view that the panel would like to ask or share before we move yes. on to opening up the questions to the, uh, to the participants. Um, and also, maybe uh, Rita, Jake, and Neil, you've got some feedback from chats or things that you might want to feed into this as well. I think there are so many questions on the Q and A. It's probably worth uh, spending some time. Um, yeah. Should we move on to the Q and A then? Okay. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Right, I've, I've got it in front of me. Um, why are there so few studies researching the gradual withdrawal from these medications? I'm guessing it doesn't serve the pharmaceutical industry industry's interests uh, yeah i mean that's the answer isn't it <laughs> i think um it's it, it, and, and in fact you can see that um that the people who've designed these studies have have uh, sometimes designed them deliberately to put people into withdrawal to you know to to produce a group who were on medication and then have it stopped suddenly and compared compared to people who carry on with it and you know even though they probably know that that's that's going to be horrible for people and produce withdrawal so i think pharmaceutical interest is part of that and you know and it also illustrates how psychiatrists have often gone along with that because they have such a sort of blinkered medicalized focus and and find it difficult i think i think a lot of psychiatrists do find it difficult to admit that their drugs are quite unpleasant <laughs> 
Yeah. I work in an early intervention program service as a psychologist. My understanding is that our NICE guidelines see, say that we need to offer antipsychotics and they should be taken for two years. If that's right, I'm wondering how psychiatrists can feel able to do things differently without fear of being criticised if there are untoward events. The antipsychotic use in my service is very high and often coercive in my opinion. However, it also seems like services are becoming more punitive towards clinicians. Yeah, um, yes, I, th I think that's right. And I think a lot of clinicians are, in fact, I was even talking to some today, are very worried about uh, going against guidelines. Um, but then on the other hand, we have lots of guidelines saying that you should listen to patients and you should take into account what patients want to do. And you know, if patients don't want to take their medication, then that's okay. There's a whole nice guideline on adherence that says you should not be pressurizing people to adhere to medication they don't want to take. So I think, you know, I think if, you, if someone wants to come off their medication in under two years, there are, you know, there, there are other guidelines, other, other support that you can go to, to as a clinician to, to um, help support people with that. I, I also think, you know, I, I think looking, you know, thinking back to the, my presenta presentation, you know, the longer you're on this medication, the more difficult it is to get off. So I actually think that the right thing to do from a pharmacological point of view is to take people off as early as you can not just leave people on you know for months and months once they've recovered sometimes it's difficult to know when when someone has quite recovered that's that's true and that can be difficult but you know are they really better or is the drugs just suppressing everything um but uh, i you know i think in general we we need to be stopping these drugs earlier what is your view on the concept of non-adherence harm reduction as an approach to antipsychotic non-adherence non within mental health services? I'm not sure I quite understand that. What's your approach to? Yeah, non-adherence harm reduction. Um, I'm not really sure. It's truthful. I don't know if Paul. I, I mean, I, I, um, I know people who quite successfully manage their difficulties by taking medication from time to time um, and to me that seems a very sensible thing to do there may be some people who can't manage that but you know for some people that does seem to work and if you can you know you're using the medication when you get a uh, you know when you get an exacerbation of symptoms and then you're stopping it when the symptoms go down and so you're not exposing yourself when you don't need it so that seems to me to be you know, intermittent use of, of medication seems to me to be sensible. It's um, lots of people are against it because there were some trials comparing intermittent use to maintenance use. Um, but again, those were withdrawal trials. The people who went into the intermittent, ma intermittent arm had previously been on maintenance treatment. So you, again, you're going to get this withdrawal effect. I think it's also important to say, we you know, people do successfully withdraw from medication. And we met last at the last meeting, Alison Beninsky, who is in her 20s, but she was on medication from the age of nine and now doesn't take any medication at all. In fact, she's kind of also dumped her mental health label as well, along with it, and is now a psychologist, but is somebody with lived experience. She still has her voices, but she's found another way to relate to them. And I think one of the things we want to make space for is we know if you want to talk to people's voices and the voices are being suppressed by neurological medication, it's far more difficult to get to the emotions that may underpin what the voices are saying. So we need psychiatrists particularly to be working with us in partnership to enable people to be on the levels of medication where they can begin to get the emotions back so we can talk with them and it seems to me what I find really interesting is why is it that psychiatry isn't opening its arms to things like the hearing voices approach as an alternative to understanding that you can engage with these experiences rather than suppress them. Yeah, um, and I think that I think that applies equally to, to situations like depression. You know, if you if you just suppress depressive feelings, people don't get through them and don't understand why they're depressed. What you know, what what those feelings are a response to, and therefore don't change something that that maybe needs to be changed. So I, I think there is a real you know real problem when you suppress feelings and thinking with um, with with psychiatric drugs. I suppose. <clears throat> 
you know, I suppose there are some people who, you know, their psychotic experiences are very severe and very consuming and it's very, you know, it, they can't even really begin to get into therapy until that's all been, you know, dampened down to some extent and, and maybe they'll never really get to the bottom of it, but they, they might find a way of sort of living with it in some way. Thank you. Is there any way to encourage GPs and psychiatrists to actively support people who, t who tr decide to withdraw from long-term psychiatric medications? And also pharmacists in terms of actual drug reductions. This all feels like a bit of a struggle. Yeah, I, I, I really sympathise. I really as it is. So, so I'm trying to set up what we're, call, what we're calling a de-prescribing service in, uh, in my um, mental health trust. And I know that there are some other psychiatrists and other doctors around the country who are doing the same thing. Um, and there is some support from NICE and Public Health England because of this big review they did on dependence on prescribed drugs and withdrawal problems. So there are things happening at the moment, but, 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 uh, but it's very piecemeal. And I know because of all the floods of inquiries I get all the time that most people find it really difficult to find someone who is supportive. Um, I, you know, I, I still come back to the, the fact that if you are not under the Mental Health Act, it is your choice about whether to take medication or not. It is your choice. And if, if your doctor turns around to you and says, I'm sorry, I'm not going to help you try and get off this safely, that seems to me to be you know very negligent practice really and um i would suggest that if that's their attitude you complain go somewhere and, and and you know demand that you go to someone else who will help you i know but i know I, because i've advised many people that that's really difficult and that they might not you know the next person they go to says the same thing i just hope that once a few of these de-prescribing services get set up it will get a bit easier Joanna, just um, this has been my experience and from you know the, speaking to other people in that unfortunately a lot of the people that I were involved with who were mental health prescribers that don't actually understand um, how to bring people off and do it safely mm -hmm. and that's a personal experience that I've been through several times. Yes, yes. No, no, I think it's a big education around it. I think that's absolutely right and um, in fact I was just talking about this today and, and, and one of um, our suggestions was that maybe we need people like you to be working in these de-prescribing services, Rita, people who've actually had experience of, of, of how difficult it can be and how, you know, and how to do this safely um, in different situations. So, yeah, because like you say, lots and lots of health workers, unless you're, you know, lucky enough to uh, work in, you know, work somewhere where there's a, an active sort of benzo support group or something that's linked in with the NHS, most, most health workers won't know what they're doing. I mean, indeed, somebody you've alluded it to it anyway this evening, and somebody in the chat mentioned about the experiences of a son, and she feels quite the monk feels quite strongly that he's had withdrawal um, things going on, but it's been put down to other things, mm -hmm. and the frustration that she feels around that because, oh, yeah. I, you know, I hope I've summarised this correctly for her. It, but it's about that if you've got a doctor that says, you know, he has to have these drugs. And you you and your son are feeling something different. Um, it's a big leap of faith um, to, to try another path that isn't always supported. Sorry, can I just ask a question? So, you know, how how does the person go about finding a psychiatrist that is more progressive in their thinking than perhaps you know the the examples that we have clearly many of us have had and, and have not appreciated. So can, can, if there is an individual working within, you know, the local area who has a, a more progressive, uh, you know, way of working than, than the average, can a person request specifically to see somebody like that? How, how does it work? I could, you know, I, I don't really, I'm, I'm sure many other people don't know, but I have absolutely no idea, you know, how this, it seems to me that you, you know, your doctor sends you to a psychiatrist, that's who you go to, that's it. I don't know whether so, a person can change at that yeah. point or not. So, so if, um, so 
what happens is that your CCG, used to be the health authority, has a contract with your local mental health trust. Um, so if you can identify someone within your trust, then you could just be asked to be referred to them. They may say, no, I'm sorry, you know, my, my job is looking after people in, who live in this area, not your area. Um, but you might be, I, I, in my trust, I'm occasionally able to see people who come from different areas. Um, uh, but if you want to be referred to someone who works at a different trust that your local CCG doesn't have a contract with, then, then the CCG needs to approve an extra contractual referral uh, and, that's more, uh, and that will cost them extra money. So you've got to make a good case for it. So that is complicated. So, um, How does a person go about finding? Finding them in the first place. I, I mean, that's uh, difficult. People, people email me and other members of the Critical Psychiatry Network a lot. Uh, um, and, and, uh, and, and we sort of email around and say, well, you know, so-and-so is living in, so-and-so, you know, would like to see a, a progressive psychiatrist. Is there anyone in this area? Um, otherwise, I, I mean, usually in you know, in, in service user groups, there's usually quite a lot of knowledge about the local consultants um, or advocacy services. So I would always go to, go to those places and ask, ask around about which consultants might be more amenable to helping people come off medication or avoid it in the mm -hmm. first place, minimize it maybe. Working with a psychiatrist ref refusing to reduce clozapine what are the dangers of self-reducing? Can you play around with reducing, then decide you may need some more before reducing again? Okay, so what I'd say about clozapine is it does seem to be a very difficult drug to get off or to reduce. Um, and it has to be, I would say it usually, it often has to be reduced in very small amounts. Um, you will often experience some withdrawal symptoms for maybe a couple of weeks or a few weeks, even after a small reduction. Um, so it, what I would say is that people make very small reductions uh, and wait until any symptoms they've experienced um, pass away before trying to make another reduction. Um, so it can be a very lengthy process um, try, trying to reduce the dose. I think it's worth also some places you can go online, like the Inner Compass Project in the States. Yeah, and that's really helpful, online. isn't it? Yeah. yeah and also, I would say Will, Will Hall's um, The Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off Medication also proposes a very slow journey and, and to check, and, you know, like two weeks check, and then, you know, and very, very small reductions. But that's a really good book. So it's a, it's a self help guide that you can find free as a PDF on the internet. Um, and we'll put it up here. As, I think it's one of our resources. If you go to our website, you'll find it as one of the resources that we promote. The Inner Compass as well. That's, that's a good yeah. one as well. It's, it's, there's a lot of literature on there. And also, we're, we're partnering with a um, project based in Montreal, which is also produced a guide called GAM, which is about um, gaining autonomy. With, med with medication which is another self-help guide where you can begin to journal your own experience of coming and reducing medication and checking how that's affecting and impacting on your emotions and your relationships so it's a good way to you know we also think I'm also very aware that we need to be thinking about our own ways to self-calm and thinking about things like grounding and any other thing that we can do to stop us going into thought loops and you know down to that, that kind of rabbit hole of anxiety so some of the things um, what I'm, i suppose i'm saying is that this is a reciprocal issue we we get the psychiatry we deserve if we keep going to ask for pills and sort out our problems so you know in a sense it's a, it's something else that we need to change about our culture about there aren't necessarily quick fixes um, around but there may be potentially some little spaces that can be useful to help us uh, uh, deal with overwhelming emotions I think there's, there's an expectation, isn't there, that we, that we should get over everything terribly quickly. I think that's part, part of what's wrong with our culture. Um, you know, and, and I think it's, it's the same even with a sort of medical condition. You know, if, if, if you're ill for longer than a couple of weeks, there's something, you know, there's something wrong with you. You're not behaving as you should do normally. 
But actually, lots of things take a long time to process, especially if bad things have happened in our lives. Uh, and we're not going to get over them that quickly. And it is going to take time. And maybe we need more you know, time out of work or out of our responsibilities. Um, uh, and, and I think we shouldn't be pressured, you know, to get better too quickly because that, that's when you feel you've got to take the medication. I've just put a link to an organisation called, well, uh, I think it's from Holland, the Tapering Strip. So oh, yeah. people are thinking about coming off. That there are um, strips that you can get so you can reduce really slowly. Um, and also I think they have ones where you can stop reducing for a bit. Um, um, so yes, yeah, there's, there's also strategies on um, Inner Compass and, and, and Will Hall's website in terms of doing it because I think uh, the only draw that they are great those tapering strips from what I hear, but they're quite expensive. Um, what are your thoughts on using psychedelics as an alternative approach to treat resistant psychiatric conditions? Um, so. So um, I don't know if anyone's read Gary, it's a, it's a book I really like, it's by Gary Greenberg. He's a sort of journalist and, and psychotherapist in the States and it's called Manufacturing Depression. And he, it, it's a critique of, uh, of sort of mainstream views of depression and the use of antidepressants. He describes himself as someone who's had a sort of low grade depression for most of his life. And he has a transformative experience when he takes ecstasy uh, with his girlfriend at a concert, not in a, not in a therapeutic situation, but in a, in a recreational situation. Um, and uh, that, 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 that experience of the ecstasy helps him to realize how much he really loves his girlfriend and um, you know, what, he, what he has in life that he really values that maybe he hadn't realized was there before. Uh, and, and he feels that that really sort of lifted him and snapped him out of his previous sort of negative cycle of thinking. Um, so to that extent, for some people, you know, that some people might have that sort of experience with psychedelics uh, and that might be useful. Um, but people have all sorts of different experiences with psychedelics. So I think the idea of sort of prescribing them for de depression is, uh, is, is strange. You know, some people have find them find taking psychedelics really scary uh, and unpleasant and don't like that feeling of sort of loss of control so um so i think it can can vary um and if they work they work through as i say through you know people having a sort of transformative experience rather than you know anything they're doing to brain chemistry or anything like that could I ask another question actually? I mean, one of the things that we'll be doing in Manchester, we've got a, we've got a campaign where we're trying to come, come up with another idea about how we can organise um, support for people who are in extreme states and, 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 and overwhelming emotional states and crisis. Um, but one of the things we realised is that the psychiatry that we have in our city is um, systemically racist. Um, it's delivered upon um, particularly young black men and they are polypharmacized and they are and they are coerced and they are more likely to spend longer terms in the hospital and also will be experiencing the same sorts of treatments within prisons as well um, and one of the things we're very concerned about is where is psychiatry or I mean I'm, I'm not it's a shame, I'm not Joanne I'm, it's, I, I wonder again is there any energy or understanding that you know in terms of social determinants marginalization and all these issues that we understand create the conditions of mental distress which then gets picked up by psychiatry and turned into broken brains. Are you, are you seeing any energy in, in terms of training, in terms of the Royal College of Psychiatry, that they're beginning to get a handle on this, on this issue, this really, really important issue? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we've, we've had quite a debate about that in the Critical Psychiatry Network, and certainly some people in that network feel... So, so, sorry, backtrack. The Royal College of Psychiatrists would tell you they are doing something about it, and it certainly was highlighted in the review of the Mental Health Act. Um, but uh, among colleagues in the, the my colleagues in the Critical Psychiatry Network feel they're not doing enough um, to, you know, to. I, I mean, I suppose the the ultimate problem, the difficulty is. It's a political problem, isn't it? It's almost certainly to do with social, you know, social, socioeconomic factors, um, experiences of racism, um, uh, and 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 therefore, 
you know something that's that's a wider you know I, th I think is a wider problem than just psychiatry not 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 that psychiatry isn't an element in it but i think that there's a, a wider problem um that precipitates it or, or helps drive it as well absolutely thank you can you share what some of the early findings in your radar project uh, no, I can't because I'm not allowed to look at the data. <laughs> uh, but uh, but we've we've enrolled 253 people, um, and uh, certainly I can say that some people have have done well. Some people have managed to substantially reduce or discontinue their medication. On the other hand, some people have relapsed, but there've been relapses in the maintenance group as well. And as I say, I'm not allowed to look. I'm not allowed to sort of look at the comparisons or anything. Um, we haven't had any any major disasters. I, I, I think what I'd like to say about it more than anything, actually, to try and give you some encouragement, is that I've been pleasantly surprised at how many psychiatrists have signed up to it willingly and been supportive. And it's not just my friends. Some of them are my friends, but but it is wider than that. Um, uh, and so so that's been really encouraging, actually. Um, that there certainly have been other psychiatrists who said no way we're not doing that that, that they do exist but there have been quite a lot who said yes we will do that and they're not necessarily people who you know massively progressive but they do recognize that this is a question we need to answer and that, that and that people do want to have this option and therefore we need to have information about what happens if you do help someone to come off gradually so that's been a, that, that's for me that's been one of the main sort of learning points so far. Yeah, I just wonder again. I mean, is, did you manage to recruit many people from the black community into the study? Um, we we have, but not not representative of our local areas. Um, so, I, and, it, and it is a problem. It is a problem across the whole of medical research that. Uh, black and ethnic minority people are underrepresented in research populations um so yeah which, which we do mirror but 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 we do have we do have um some thank you what do you what do you consider to be the best alternatives to drug treatments it, it entirely depends on the nature of the problem um uh, so it, even 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 for any different diagnosis if you take depression you know that there is no one alternative there are lots of different alternatives depending on what the depression indicates what it means what it's a response to what what the person's situation is generally and the same with psychosis um, you know again it, each person's situation will be individual and the psychosis will be a response to a different thing in all cases and, and therefore need different different forms of management. Uh, hi Joanna, my son was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia at age 22-23. He has been admitted to hospital five times in six years, normally relapses when he chooses to stop his meds. He also has a cannabis addiction and has used other drugs. Came out of hospital again recently, now seems to be going into psychosis again. He's still on aripiprazole 500 milligrams one, once a month. What is you, your view on the best way forward? Um, I, think, I, I think you have to get into a position where he's stable and then and then work out a plan then, then work out what he wants and a plan that will hopefully help him keep stable i guess that's what's i, I guess that's what people are trying to do um but uh you know i don't i don't think there's any other any other real approach difficult to help people when they're really chaotic and you know and, and psychotic and using drugs we, we used to I mean, something like um, the Soteria House, you know, or, or a, um, you know, like a rehab ward that, that tried to minimise drug use is, is what would be ideal in that situation, I think, where you've got somewhere where someone like that can be contained and supported over a sort of longer period. So hopefully 
he can develop some more, you know, some more adaptive ways of, of coping. Um, but, uh, but I'm afraid we don't have many of those sorts of facilities left. What is Joanna's view of the relevance of trauma history, ACEs underpinning mental illness? The, the relevance of trauma history and... Yeah, ACEs is... is oh, adverse childhood events. Yes. Okay. That's it. Um, so, so I think... Um, uh, I think they're relevant in many cases, but not all. I, you know, I, I do come across people who have got sometimes quite serious psychotic illnesses who've had very what look like very happy and normal childhoods and don't seem to have experienced any trauma. So I, I think that often trauma is a factor, but not always. What do you think of the recent developments in Norway where they're having medication free wards if people choose to go there? I think it's wonderful. I went to visit one in northern Norway. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it was great. Um, it made me very jealous. You know, they've got a lovely, a well funded health service where they had lots of different forms of therapy and support for people um on the ward and then they were hoping to develop a follow-up service and it felt very you know it felt like a sort of well-supported environment um where there were good? alternatives in the sense of you know lots of different activities music therapy and you know helping people to go out into the beautiful countryside and yeah so so yeah i think it's a really good thing okay so we know we're not the last three minutes of a meeting, so I thought, Neil, if you could ask one more question from the panel, yeah. maybe we can go back to the panellists to just wrap it up and say anything that you may want to, to share in respect to what we've heard from Joanna for the last few minutes of a meeting, if that would be okay. Is that right? This is a good one. I'm a psychologist working in the mental health system, but accepts, uh, accepts the disease-centred model without question. I pro long-term use and does not openly consider the drug-centred approach at present or pres present this view to service users. As someone who agrees with your position, how can I best influence the system to the benefit of service users? It's really difficult if you're working with people with different views. I mean, I always suggest, you know, you, you've got to find allies you've got to take a very long-term approach. I do little education sessions for my team <clears throat> um, and, uh, you, you know, explain my views and discuss a bit of literature. Uh, and, and maybe, so maybe that would be a good approach and just starting sort of very low key. Uh, but it is, it is difficult if there are, you know, important members of the team like the psychiatrist who, who don't agree. Um, that, that that is difficult you can still go along and talk to local user groups though and put a, a different point of view across um i i mean i know that sometimes that's really confusing for people but i still think it's important that people are informed okay well thank you joanna for answering all those we've had so many 54 questions a lot of questions deep not just simple questions detailed um observations and questions and somebody has quite rightly said, how, how come you neglected to mention open dialogue? Well, can we say a big shout to open dialogue? And we've actually yesterday, we we're talking about how we can uh, try to generate open dialogic practice in, in our city in Manchester, because I think it's really part of me understanding this thing called psychosis in, in, as a relational, having a relational element to it, and that it doesn't just belong to the person because they have a brain that's broken, but it's to do with things that have happened and dynamics that might be going on within a group as well. So totally think that open dialogue is showing us uh, another possibility of improving the kind of holistic care and support that people need. So I'd just like to go around the group and if anybody else has got any observations or points of view they'd like to raise before we close the meeting. I just want, um, I've said I can acknowledge um, all the thank yous and appreciations on the chat for Joanna sparing the time and speaking so, so well on the subject. Um, I just want, as a panellist, sort of acknowledge there's lots on the chats and lots in the questions that we haven't been able to answer. And I really don't want people to go away and think that we're not acknowledging that and haven't heard that. 
and we will be meeting tomorrow to have a look at how in some way we can address those it probably won't be perfect but we just acknowledge that some people haven't had their answers the questions answered and we'll try and do something about it we have saved the chat and we'll make sure that we've got an opportunity to go through all of your comments and discussions to help us improve future events and to reflect on this one as well Yeah, I just want to thank Joanna as well. It's it's really pioneering, interesting work that you're doing. Very useful to have someone on side like you. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for spending some time with us, and it's been really you know, quite insightful. But thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for all your comments. It's been really interesting. Yes, thank you very much. I've got nothing more to add. It's just really insightful. And, and it's great that you exist. That's really, really encouraging, really encouraging. And, um, you know, I think it's so important to support each other because as you've identified, it's not always easy to get the right support uh, from the services. OK, well, on that really quite positive note and with apologies to those people who feel that the question hasn't been answered. Um, just to say we're learning how to use Zoom. This is the first time we've held a meeting anywhere near as big as this. So we were a little bit intimidated by the tech. Um, we kind of managed it, we think. I'm sure we can improve it. Um, and also, I hope you will look out for future events that we organise. Um, we'll be coming up, hopefully, with another one in a few weeks because we bought quite an expensive Zoom package. <laughs> so we want to get our money back. So we might be doing another event, which we'll ask him for some small donations. So thank you very much, John and Moncrief. You can find her. If you check out John and Moncrief, you'll see that on on um, Amazon and other places you can find her publications. Um, I would really recommend The Straight Talking Guide as a, a really good start to looking at this issue because it's written specifically for people with lived experience and families and others. Um, but also to look, 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 if you want to, dive deep into her research and her work because it is giving us some very important, I think, information that, you know, will, will you arm us when we go in to speak to our prescribers so we can ask them information about things that we have heard today and learn, we'll learn about by reading about this in more detail. So on, on that note, thank you very much, Joanna, for your time. Thank you. For your work. And we hope one day to meet you again. And maybe we can keep in contact with you about what we're trying to do here in Manchester. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I'd really like to hear. Okay. okay. Yeah. On that note, can I just thank everybody for coming along today? Um, please send this information, feedback. Uh, any other comments from anybody, Neil or anybody? So, on that note, I'm going to close the meeting shortly and um, the panel will get back together, as we said, in a few days time or tomorrow to, to, to follow this up. So thank you everybody for coming along and um, we'll see you again uh, in the future, I hope. I hope so. Thank you. Bye.